All right, let's just start off by reading what we're going to talk about today. 1 Peter 3, 1 to 7, which goes like this. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be hidden. Be, excuse me. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, the former times, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, as, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may be hindered. Okay, we're going to skip all that. No, we're not going to skip all that. <laughs> No, no, no. Uh, we're still in the context that is found back in chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. And I want to read that and we'll come back to these verses. Remember, chapter 2, verses 11 and 12 said this, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles or among the unbelievers, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. What we're talking about is living as an example of Jesus among unbelievers. Remember we said that last week. Let's try it again. Living as an example of Jesus among unbelievers. One more time. Living as an example of Jesus among unbelievers. That is the context which we find ourselves in. It's, he started off in verse 13 talking about just in general people submit to the government because God has put that government above you and it's there for a reason. We're supposed to pay taxes. We're supposed to do whatever the government is. tells us to do so long as it doesn't contradict God's word. So he says submit to that. And then he goes on to talking about household servants, not slaves so much as household servants, how they are to submit to their masters the good masters and the harsh ones, even the ones who beat them, which was the culture back then. Um, and he says, this is what you're supposed to do, because after all, that's what Jesus did. When Jesus came, he submitted to the government to the point of death. He came as a servant and was beaten and was abused and was an example. He bore our sins. That's what his example showed us. And now he's going to step into the arena of marriage and, and marriage relationships. Now, this is actually going to be kind of a, a two-parter. This is actually part two of last time, so I guess it could be like a two-and-a-half-parter because uh, we're going to talk about this passage that discusses marriage this week and then probably go more into marriage next week because it's, it's a, obviously it's a, critical, it's a critical area. And what I want to say up front is this, is that there are some topics that just have a lot of baggage. There are some topics in Scripture, some passages, some concepts that just people bring a lot of baggage to them. When you, when you come, and this is one of those. Sometimes it's theological things like predestination and free will. Sometimes it's, it's uh, just practical living when it comes to husbands and wives. They bring experience. They bring prior teaching. They bring culture to it. And what we need to do as best as we can is set aside all the baggage that will weigh us down and simply look at the text in context, its immediate context, but the context of Scripture overall so that we see what the Bible actually says, because in some of these cases, the way it comes across is not at all what it says, yet people take what it doesn't say, make it say that, and say, look, the Bible is bad. And that's not, we're going to, we're going to try to fix some of that. In fact, there's so much baggage with this that it comes to mind frequently as I was trying to study and teach this, and I had to say, no, I don't want to get sidetracked on that or on that, but I want to talk about it, so if I seem... <laughs> more sidetracked than normal is because I'm trying to stay on track with uh, what's actually in front of us. So we're going to go through this, like I said, this week, and then we're going to broaden our scope when it comes to marriage next week and look at more of what Scripture has to say because it really does shed light on, on what we're going to talk about here. And another problem in addition to baggage is that when you read some things sometimes and you say, okay, it says this, if it's we kind of go, was the opposite then true or untrue? 
we go in extremes. We swing back and forth. For example, in one place in Scripture, it says, let, let the women remain silent in church. And it doesn't, does that mean they can never talk ever? It's like, well, no, that's not the point. It's, it's, that's, that's an example of bad thinking. We swing the opposite way, and, and that's, the opposite isn't the point. The point is the point. So, and understanding the point in context is, is more important to getting the point. You get my point? Okay, good. Good. So again, living as an example of Jesus among what? Unbelievers. That is the context, the immediate context of what we're going to talk about. And we just read about husbands and wives, and I want to give you a deep, profound, biblical truth that our world is having a harder and harder time with. Okay, you ready for this? Men and women are different. <gasps> right on cue. That was awesome. That was more than I could ever hope for. Men and women are different. Duh. I mean, come on, world. Figure, I mean, not just biologically, emotionally, spiritually, physically, we are different. Now, on the one hand, when you look at men and women genetically, there's just like one switch that's different. Otherwise, we're very much the same, but there are significant differences across the board, and God has made it that way. That's God's plan. Uh, not only are we made different, God has given us different roles. Men and women in a marriage relationship have different roles. And again, the context is marriage. It's not just men in general and all women in general. I should probably try to filter myself and say husbands and wives have roles have parts to play. And in fact, you can think of it in terms of a play. They have different roles, but one role is not not inherently better than the other. One is not inherently more or less valuable than the other. One is not inherently more or less significant than the other. They are just different. I mean, take the characters Romeo and Juliet. Different roles, different characters in a play. But which one's more important? <laughs> he who says his wife is not here. <laughs> it's on recording. It's on the internet. It's going to go everywhere. No. Which one's more important? Really, aside from Justin. They're the equally important, aren't they? If you take one out of the story, you have no story. You have no play. You have no, and the play is the thing, as, as the man says. They are different parts, different roles, and men and women have different parts, have different roles in husbands and wives in a marriage, in a relationship. And this is what Peter is going to talk about in our passage, and that's what we're going to talk about next week as well, just again to broaden our scope. So let's look at what Peter actually says here in chapter 3. Wives. What are wives? Wives are the, the women half of the marriage, okay? And <laughs> men and women. Marriage, male and female. God made them in the beginning, male and female. Wives, husbands. So wives are the women half, married women. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands. So the likewise tells you what? It tells you in the same way as the thing we just talked about, right? The thing right before this, which was uh, servants be submissive to your masters with all fear. And then he, he expanded on that. The idea is is to continue to be in submission. Now, here's this heavy word. What does this submission, be submissive, mean? And we'll sort of remind what we talked about last time. It's not, you know, shut up, lay down, go make me a sandwich submission. It's not animal pet submission. It's voluntary, willful cooperation. It's, we talked about how it's, it was used as a military term when you arrange soldiers under a commander. They willfully, voluntarily step up and say, yes, I'm going to surrender my own will to yours because that's how the organization works. Right? That's one example. But the idea is willfully. The idea is cooperation. The idea is I'm going to come along with you because this is our relationship and I will you know, defer to your authority willfully, voluntarily. Is that coming across? Okay, so it's not submission like when someone twists your arm in an arm lock and makes you say uncle submission. This is voluntary. That's why when you get married, you, you, you do that willingly, I hope. <laughs> At least in our culture today, you, of course you watch, you know, what is it, Monster Brides or whatever. The, the uh, No, thank you. 
bridezilla, and it's the same thing. Um, same idea. This is awful. You, no, I mean, run away, quick, dude. No, it's, it's, you do this together. You do this willingly. You, you submit to the arrangement. Um, so like wives, likewise, in this same way, like we just talked about, be submissive or continue to be submissive to your own husbands. Not to somebody else's husband. You don't have to be submissive. It, the, the point is, it's not every man everywhere that this man-woman relationship exists where all women are supposed to be submissive to all men. It's in the marriage relationship primarily. Wives submit to husbands, not women submit to all men all the time. Okay? That's why he says it this way. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands. He puts that in there on purpose. Submissive to your own husbands. That even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. So he says this even if they're unbelievers. And he, I think, he, again, because our context is living as an example of Jesus among unbelievers. Okay, He's telling wives in general, be submissive to your own husbands, even the ones who don't believe. And I think he put that in there. It seems to me that there may have been some Christian women married to unsaved men who thought, well, he's not a Christian, so I, I don't have to submit to him like that, do I? Yeah, huh? <laughs> and Peter's saying, even to the ones who don't believe, wives, be in, that, be in your role, be in your part in the marriage, even to the ones who don't believe. And here's why. Um, that they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. So, your behavior as, an unbelieving, as a believing wife to the unbeliever husband, your behavior can be a model to that one can be an example to that one of what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be in relationship with God, what it means to be forgiven and walking in grace and having joy and peace despite whatever is happening around you, which is what we've been talking about leading up until now. You can be that, and your example may win them over without you ever having to say a word. It's not like the wife has to continually, are you going to come to church today? Are you going to come to church today? Are you going to come to church? He says, no, don't, don't do it like that. Without a word, just your conduct, just your behavior, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. Now, some of this is what I'm going to call a reversible concept. Some of these principles we're going to see that he talks about, at least two of them, are reversible context, uh, meaning that Husbands, believing husbands could do this with unbelieving wives. And I think this is one of those things. That even if some, switch it around, even if some unbelieving wives and you're the believing husband, you can win them over without a word. Without having to pester them, without having to continually feel like you're going to preach at them and show them, you know, this is what it says in the word and you're being a heathen or whatever, you know, whatever the thing is. You don't have to do that, that you can as a husband, but by your behavior, without a word, be an example, and win them over by the conduct of your life. So again, I, th I think that's a reversible thing. I, I was talking to a pastor friend of mine about this, and we sort of agreed that, yeah, that, that's, that in itself is a reversible con concept, reversible principle. So we're going to see some of those. So husbands and wives can do this. Live your life as a Christian without having to be in your face, overly zealous, preachy, and you got to come because the, the people at church are going to know, and you're not in this. It's, no, you don't have to do that. Just love Jesus in front of your spouse. That's, that's really continually, consistently, that's what he's talking about. And he goes on to sort of expand on that. Verse 2, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Excuse me, in this word observe, we've seen before, it's the same idea that's back in verse 12, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. So it's as the husbands observe, as they inspect, as they see, as they watch you go through this, doing your, you know, being a, a Christian woman, that when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. This chaste conduct, you know, we don't use that word chaste a whole lot. I mean, just generally it means pure, that you're behaving in a pure way, a, an un, a clean way. This word can also be used uh, to, to communicate the idea of virginal, an, an undefiled, a pure way. So you could actually read this in a husband-wife relationship that you, as a Christian wife, aren't flirting with other men. 
that you weren't, because it was, a, as is today, but then more so, was a very promiscuous society. And to be deliberately, specifically monogamous in that Greek-Roman culture was kind of odd, kind of not necessarily normal. But he says, you, with your chaste conduct, accompanied by fear. And it's not fear, dread, because again, you, you can read this and twist it, and you have to be submissive, and you have to be afraid, and it's bad, or eh, woman, do this. No, this fear has the idea of respect, that you respect your husband, that you respect your spouse. Uh, a pastor friend of mine was talking about a counseling experience he had. Uh, a woman came to his office, and her husband was in the process of leaving her for another woman. And as they were talking, she was so, you know, obviously despondent and sad and, and was looking at this pastor, and, and she looked at him and said, you know, if you don't respect your husband, someone else will. And he was like, yeah, that makes sense. If you don't respect your spouse, someone else is going to, whether it be at work or, or wherever that is, that, that wherever the environment is, can exist where that can sort of foment and, and brew. If you don't love your spouse, someone else will. If you don't endear your spouse, someone else will. As, as we, if over time, if life gets in the way and you have kids and you have money pressures and you start to become more split apart and that, that love and respect and endearment can, can become lost and it can surface in other places and that's what causes these things to spring up and these problems to exist and the, and the things get even wider. But it's just such a simple way to put it that if you don't fill in the blank, love, respect, endear your spouse, someone else is going to. And our marriages ought to be not divided by life, but life ought to bring our marriages together. So he's trying to communicate to these Christian women, this is what we need to do. Even to the unbelieving ones, be an example of Jesus to them. And he says, so he says, here's what you do. This is what you don't do. Verse 3. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, putting on fine apparel. And the, the emphasis, if we could switch this around a little bit in English, it would be a little bit more like this. Um, if I can let it not be. The emphasis is the be. You see where it says, do not let your adornment be? Be is the command. You could say be not if you want to turn it into Yoda speak. You know, be not let your, con your adornment, <laughs> which sounds really odd. But that's the emphasis. Don't let this be. Be is the command, or it's, it's a negative command. Don't be. Don't let your, con your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing a gold, putting on fine apparel. So the emphasis is the adornment, what is outward. And this is really kind of funny to me anyway. This word for adornment is the word cosmos. And usually when you see cosmos translated in the New Testament in Greek, of course, it means world, or it means the universe. So your adornment, your, your world. But it really conveys the idea of order out of chaos. <laughs> um, your adornment, your hair, what you put on. Um, and it's in fact from this word that we get the word cosmetic. Order out of chaos. <laughs> uh, or as J. Vernon McGee puts it, if the fence needs painting, paint it. I'm not, in, you know, I'm not telling you guys. That's, that's not what I'm. That's not my point. But uh, your your world, your adornment, your outward uh, expression, your outward looks. He says, don't make that the focus. Um, in other words, in order to try to maintain your relationship with your husband, don't become a supermodel. Don't try to, you know, become the, the, the thin hotness that's going to keep your man with you because you're so attractive and you're so good looking. He says, don't let that, he's not saying don't ever put on makeup or fix your hair or, or wear gold. He's not saying, that's not the point, it's not ever. The point is don't let that be the focus. You know, don't try to attract your man with unspiritual things because as you try to do that, and he's finding what he needs other places, you're going to get to the point where you're going to think, am I not enough for you? And you're going to keep trying harder, try to win, try to fight, but you're fighting the wrong battle. And this also is a reversible concept. You know, guys, if as you have an unbelieving wife, and she's out there, and you're, there's this, this unspoken or maybe spoken division, you know, don't try to 
be the man who, again, and maybe it is a physical thing. You, you try to be fit and trim and you try to dress nice and, you, and you're going to provide a lot of money and you're going to provide a lot of security and you're going to provide a lot of social status and you, can't, and you can't say, isn't this enough for you? Aren't I working hard enough for you to keep you in this relationship? You have to go and find these other guys and do this other stuff. Don't let that outward adornment, your cosmos, your world, be the thing that draws and keeps your spouse with you. Rather, he says in verse 4, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. This hidden person of the heart. Uh, this, well, this whole verse reminds me of uh, 1 Samuel 16 when uh, Saul and is choosing David and Saul shows up and, and tries to pick, there's all these brothers and they're taller and, and he goes to the, the biggest one and God says no, next one no, next one no. Finally gets down to scrawny David and, and God says to, to Samuel, you know, Samuel, man looks on the outward appearance but God looks on the heart. He, we look on the outside, we judge from the outside and God says no, it, it's in the heart first. That's where we need to go. People look on the outside, God looks on the inside and if we're supposed, if we're people of God, that's how we ought to be too, and that ought to be our attractional element. Not how flashy we are, not how good looking we might be, not how cool we can be, or we have all the hippest toys. None of that. He says, no, rather let it be the hidden person of the heart um, with an incorruptible beauty. Because all those things in verse 3 are corruptible. He's making a contrast. The things in verse 3, the, the trying to get all gussied up and pretty and handsome and whatever you want to call it, those are corruptible. It's the incorruptible beauty of that inner person. Uh, again, as opposed to verse 3. And, he, and then he says, a gentle and quiet spirit. Now, what is he not saying? Does he, he, does he, mean, does he mean that I as a woman have to be weak and broken and submissive like that? No, that's not what he's... Because again, that's one of those opposites. You have to be quiet and you have to be gentle and you have to be sit quietly and only speak when spoken to and don't make eye contact with people. No, it's not what we're talking about. It means... Let me tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean someone who is prone to anger. Some of the words in the dictionary for this thing, the opposites. It's, it's, you can really get an idea of what a word doesn't mean by learning its opposite. This word does not mean, it means someone who's not prone to anger, or savage, or fierce, or difficult. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but sometimes when you flip channels, you see people, and, and particularly women in some cases, who are these things. And that's not me trying to be sexist, that's just observing human nature. Okay, that's In many cases, when you watch... People, anger, savage, fierce, difficult, all right? What he's trying to say is people who are generally calm, generally tranquil. This is that quiet and gentle spirit, someone who is calm, tranquil, generally in control. Not out of control, freaking out all the time, okay? That's, that's, what, he's, that's what he's talking about. And then he goes on to say even that that is very precious in God's sight, so you could ask yourself the question, who are you trying to impress? Are you trying to impress your spouse with the way you look on the outside, or are you trying to impress God, which will then hopefully you know, reflect and attract your spouse? Are you trying to have, what are you trying to dress up, in other words? Who are you trying to impress, the world, your spouse, or God? Um, because, you know, and I, I think this is, I'm trying to, See if I can make this even more clear. But it seems to me, as, as a Christian man, but I think this is even true for, for non-Christian men, that a godly woman, a woman who is really in love with the Lord and is in the Word and is just spiritually lit up, is hot. <laughs> can I say that in church? I just did. Um, I, thank you. That a, that, I mean, and I don't know... In every way, a godly woman is just so attractive. And when, when unsaved guys come across a godly woman, they don't know what it is. I mean, the, the woman may be average looking. She does not have to be, you know, either. She may be right in the middle, is my point. But she's got that God in her, coming out of her. And even, and even unsaved guys can see that and go, something about you, something different. And, and it's... And it's attractive on, on many levels. 
Uh, so, you know, ladies, if you want to, you know, really not make, that's the wrong word, if you want your man to really come after you, <laughs> I'm trying to put this as delicately as I can, become a godly woman, become a more godly woman. Just focus on Jesus. Make Jesus the first love of your life, and as you do that, the men folk will see it and go, yes, there's something about that. There's something, and you will want to give up, and you will want to come after. And the ultimate goal, as Peter here says, is that they may be one without a word, which, again, is that reversible concept, that reversible principle. Now, let's look at this from another way, too. Um, a relationship that's based on verse 3, okay? The arranging of the hair, wearing of gold, putting on a fine apparel. A relationship that's based on just the physical, trying to be hot, trying to be attractive, guess where it's going to end? Right there. That's as far as it's going to go, because the, as soon as that goes away, as soon as that stops, the relationship will then slowly dissolve and disintegrate. But a relationship that is built on a verse 4 with a godly spirit, that quiet and gentle spirit, or just a God-centered person, that's also where the relationship will end. We could flip it on. It's not going to end. That's where it goes. That's where it keeps going. So the relationship based on verse 3 stops there. If you try to get a man, get your woman by being attractive on the outside, it's not going to go anywhere, but it only goes somewhere in that verse 4 way. That's what's most important. So Peter says he's emphasizing that, stressing that. Go after that. That's what you need. For, and then he gives an illustration. For, this, for in this manner, verse 5, in former times the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, which is you know, a, kind of a, an odd way to put it. They're adorning themselves on the inside. Usually you think of adorning yourself as something you can see on the outside, but it's your adorning on the inside, which then does come out. Being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Now that's not, he's not saying, women, call your husband Lord. That's, you know, that's between you two. I'm not telling you that, and Peter's not telling you that. He's trying to communicate that they put themselves in this same submission, submissive, cooperative relationship. Whose daughters you are if you, do, if, you are, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. And I think the incident, the transition Peter's talking about is this. You remember if you read this back in Genesis 22, or Genesis before 22, um, God has promised Abraham and Sarah offspring. They're pushing 100, and there's no offspring. So Sarah goes, okay. Obviously, God's not going to do this, so we're going to make this happen. All right? She goes into not submissive mode. She goes into not cooperative mode. She steps up, puts on the pants, and takes over. It says, Abraham, sleep with my maid. Creepy in our culture today, but that's how they did it back then. Sleep with her and have a kid through her, and she will be your child, and then that's how God's going to fulfill this thing. And he did. And there was a kid, but God said, uh-uh. -uh. Not what I have in mind. And, and some years later, God again reminds him, you're going to have a child. And that child you had first, Ishmael, is not the one of promise. He's the one of the flesh. He's your thing. You're going to have your, your own son through your own body, through Sarah. And Sarah eventually became pregnant, but she went through that transition of going from, I'm going to make this happen to, okay, God, fine. I'm going to submit. I'm going to cooperate. And at, you know, what was it, 90 years old? something, had a baby, Abraham being 100 years old, way past when it should have happened, so that's why it's a miracle. I think that's the submission, that, that uh, the moment, that phase that Peter's talking about. She finally said, okay, I'm going to cooperate. I'm not going to try to take over. I'm not going to try to be in charge because that's the role, the part that God has given my husband. And then God worked, right? Then God provided the son of promise, through whom came, he was Isaac, and then brain cramp, uh, <laughs> Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I was trying to think of those three. Who came Jacob, and then the 12 sons, and then Israel, and then ultimately, Jesus, right? It was because Sarah finally cooperated, understood her part, understood her role, understood her husband's role, because Abraham wasn't working in his role with Ishmael, was he? He, it was flipped. He became the one who submitted and cooperated. And that's not God's arrangement. That's not God's plan. And again, it's not better than, it's not more valuable than, it's not inherent worth. It is simply roles. It is simply parts that we are to play 
in our marriages. So, verse 6 again, Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Because the only person we're supposed to be afraid of is God. We're supposed to respect our husbands, but fear God. So he's, he spends six verses on wives, which is funny, and then one verse on husbands. Don't read too much into that. <laughs> it's not he's saying, guys, you're doing fine, ladies, we need a lot of work here, we need some, we need some help. No, it's no. That's not, don't read too much into that. But he says in verse 7, Husbands, likewise, and again, following the pattern that, of what just came before, likewise, dwell with or live with, and that marriage, cohabitation, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together with the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Okay, so again, this is one that you could read and say, see, the Bible is degrading women. He's telling husbands, you've got to live with understanding because women are stupid and you have to live with them because they're weaker and you're stronger. You're a man and women are wimpy. No, 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 no. Again, what is the context of this passage? Living as an example of Jesus among unbelievers. And when you keep that in mind, this makes a whole lot more sense. Husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding. Why with understanding? Because you were once unbelievers too. And if you're living with a spouse who is an unbeliever, it's going to take some understanding, some remembering, some patience, because their behavior is not going to be the same as yours. Their priorities are not going to be the same as yours. Their values, their everything is not going to be the same. So you have to remember, you have to live with understanding, knowledge that they're still there. They're still back there in the world, and you're walking with the Lord, okay? And it's, it can be very easy, again, in either way, when one spouse is not to go, oh, why don't you just get it? No, you have to be understanding. You have to remember. You have to have that patience. And again, why does he call the wives weaker in this context? Because they're unbelievers. That's the weakness. It's not the inherent weakness that people read into it because man is strong and a woman is weak and all the other... There's so much just gibberish that people read into these things. It drives me crazy. Well, you go back to the Garden of Eden and it was Eve who was weak. and it was Adam. No, that's not it at all. The context is believer versus unbeliever. He's calling her weaker because she is an unbeliever. Because, again, the behavior is different. The thinking is different. There is a weakness there. That's all. That's it. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them. Believing husbands, I'm going to tag that in there to remind us of the context. Believing husbands, likewise, dwell with unbelieving wives with understanding, giving honor to the wife, treating her with honor, treating her with respect, just as the believing wife was supposed to give the unbelieving husband respect and, you know, and uh, submit to him. The believing husband is supposed to give the unbelieving wife honor. Supposed to treat her with honor, supposed to treat her with dignity. It's not the excuse to say, well, I don't really don't have to love and respect her because she's not a believer. Same thing, just flipped around. Treat your unbelieving wife with respect, with honor, goodness. As to the weaker vessel, again, because she's an unbeliever, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Because if you live a compromised life, your prayer gets hindered. If you live a life trying to serve two masters, if you're trying to make your wife happy and trying to make your God happy, you're walking a fence, okay? You'll be living a compromised life, and when you do that, your prayers will be hindered. And to be hindered simply means to be slowed down, to be impeded, to be hung up. It's like you're trying to go somewhere and you're, something's hung up on your leg and you can't move forward, you can't make progress. If you're living this compromised life, your prayer gets hindered because you're focusing too much on other stuff instead of focusing on just the one. You can't serve two masters. Or in other words, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, right? And if your treasure is split up, your heart's split up and completely ineffective that your prayers may not be hindered. So... Unbelieving spouses, this, this is what Peter's advice is. And as far as I know, it's the only place where, well, I take it back, it's, the, it's one of the primary places where it's, it's talked about like this. 
Paul talks about it in at least two epistles about husbands and wives. Um, but here it's unbelieving the situation. So the question does come up, though, is divorce an option? If you just get to the point where you, you feel like you're not going to come to any reconcilable you know, relationship and just comp- no, is divorce an option? And according to Paul, divorce is not an option, at least not on your part as the believer. In 1 Corinthians 7, which is a fun passage, um, I'm going to read two verses and, and uh, because the ones before it and after it bring up a whole lot more baggage that I don't want to get derailed on today. Um, but 1 Corinthians 7, 12 and 13 say this. But to the rest, he's talking about marriage and relationships and different combinations of how all this works. But to the rest, I, not the Lord, he's saying this is Paul's advice, not the Lord, say, if, a, if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. So he's saying just because one's an unbeliever doesn't mean an automatic, you know, get out of marriage free card. It's not what it is. It's not, okay, you don't believe? Okay, well, I'm out of here. Because frequently what will happen is a couple is married and time goes on and one of them becomes a believer. The other one doesn't. Sometimes they both do. But what, what can happen is one will and one won't. In, in my own family, that's what happened. My dad and my mom were divorced. were already divorced, so it gets different, but it's kind of the same. Because they still live together off and on. And he probably listens to this, so I've got to be really careful. In fact, I know he does. And it freaks me out. Dad, stop it. No. Um, <laughs> they were divorced, uh, but then they were together on again, off again, and because there were two of my sister and I were in the picture, they maintained ties. But um, dad became a Christian, and um, mom still wasn't, and nobody understood what this crazy Jesus stuff was in dad's life. And, but eventually, somehow, he started making me go to church to middle school, and I sort of plugged into the Christian scene, but eventually my mom also became a Christian, I've shared this story before, but because of his conduct, not because he preached at her or bugged her, but because of his conduct, the change in his life occurred, she became a Christian, and they get married back to one another. Sometimes it happens. Same thing happened in Jess's family, almost the same kind of story. Parents divorced, get saved independently, come back together and get married. So it happens. It happened to to both of our families. But it's not a free, get out of jail, of marriage free card when, when, you know, this one jail, sorry. <laughs> Freudian slip there. Is it hot in here? <laughs> Monopoly brain. It's not, a, it's not the first option. But he does, in, in another place, he does say, but if they leave you, there's not much you can do about that. If the other spouse, the unbelieving spouse, leaves you, you know, it's, not, it's, it's a tough situation, and there are all kinds of variables that could be talked about, but if they are bent on divorce and leaving you, he says to let them go. You know, and, and who knows? It's not, even divorce is not the end. It's not too late, as I just talked about in my own family. But um, don't seek the divorce, but if the divorce comes from the other side, you know, just, he says, let them go, it's, and uh, hopefully God will work on them. So let's kind of wrap up this part today. The ability to even do this, to be in a relationship where you're a believer and your spouse is not, comes from Jesus. Only place it can come from. The only place it can come from. And I know people in our own fellowship are going through this with unbelieving spouses. And had I time, I could go into detail on a story about a couple named uh, Rawl and Sharon Reese. Raul was a Vietnam vet, post-traumatic stress disorder, completely whacked out, was going, had come home to kill his family. His wife was a strong Christian, and she had gone to the mother's house to get away because he was abusive physically, emotionally, every way to get, and he came back, and he was waiting in the living room with a gun to kill them. But Chuck Smith comes on TV and shares the love of God, and he becomes a Christian, and wife comes home, and she, he says, I've changed, I'm different, and the marriage is built back together. But it was only because of Jesus that that happened. And even in these things, and I'm not trying to shoehorn Jesus into every passage we find, but guess what? Jesus is an example of both of these, which is really very cool. Jesus submitted himself. He didn't do anything to make himself attractive, did he? 
fact, that's what the world was looking for. The, the Jews were looking for this macho king to come and kick Rome out to be attractive on the horse, right? And then and kick out all the bad guys. No, he came in as a carpenter, as a relative in that society. Nobody from a backwater, nowhere town. He didn't do anything to make himself attractive, but instead did what it took to draw us close to God, like the unbelieving spouse does what he or she is supposed to do to reflect, to draw the, the unbelieving spouse to the Lord. So that's how he submitted himself. At the same time, he lived with us as unbelievers, when we were all unbelievers. Remember Romans 5, 8, that God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, while we were still unbelievers, Christ died for us. He, taking the husband's side of our talk today, lived with us with understanding, waiting, knowing where we were, where we come from, where we've been, um, waited with understanding because we were the weaker vessel in that relationship when we were unbelievers. Waited patiently. And how, did he, how does he know what we went through? Because he came here. Again, God put on a man suit, went through life, birth, growing up, living, death and resurrection, which again, all of us will go through someday, he understands. I mean, Hebrews says that we have a high priest who understands what we've gone through because he went through it. He went through it all. He understands. He knows we're the weaker one and he treats us still with honor, waiting for us to come back around to him. His giving of himself was in itself a demonstration of God's love for us. He went through everything. But the strength to do this only comes through Jesus. So whatever the state of your marriage, married to an unbeliever, married to another believer, whatever position you happen to find yourself in, whatever the state of your life is, the first best thing that you can do is have a right relationship with Jesus. The first best thing you can do if your marriage is doing eh, or if it's in the toilet, the first best thing you can do to fix it is not harass and bug and throw books at and say, let's go to counseling repeatedly and nag. Either way, the first best thing you can do is for you just to go to Jesus, to go on your knees and to pray and say, God, change me, make me into the person you want me to be and use me to bring them to you. Have a right relationship with Jesus.